Hey guys, it is Thursday, May 16th. Bitcoin's at 66,000. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about financial engineering and how financial engineering drives bull markets. So let's go back to the 2017 bull market. Um, we had Bitcoin that went from $1,000 beginning of the year to, you know, really about 14,000 and it spiked to $20,000. But we had this huge rally in 2017. And in Bitcoin. Now, where was that a lot of that rally coming from? Well, a lot of it was coming from two kinds of things. One was there was a lot of ICOs in 2017. So people raised a lot of money. Uh, people who raised that money uh, immediately sold whatever, whatever they were, they were getting Ethereum and they bought some Bitcoin, right? Exchanges were super active in that, um, in that period. So exchanges were nonstop uh, borrowing and tether and buying Bitcoin because everything was kind of going up. And so this ability to borrow uh, in, in stable coins and tether and then to um, buy Bitcoin with that, that was the first piece of financial engineering. It's really enabled by places like Binance and Bitfinex who really had sort of, uh, were the bank effectively for that, that period. Um, and, you know, that, that could go up to a certain point, but it didn't bring in new sources of money that was going to need to get it beyond, say, the $20,000 or the $15,000 level. So then we had the second bull market in Bitcoin. <clears throat> the second bull market was in 2020. And how was that market so different? Well, it was a, a really different piece of technology that uh, drove the financial engineering there. And what I mean by that is, is this. We had Grayscale. And Grayscale, the GBTC, uh, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, enabled, was a, the first really enabler that mainstream investors could buy Bitcoin without custodying it on, say, Coinbase. And how did that work? Well, it worked by, it was a closed, it is a, it was a closed end fund at the time. It was converted now into an ETF. But it was a closed end fund, meaning that there wasn't any direct measure of how, uh, mechanism for if you have a certain amount, if Grayscale owns a certain amount of uh, Bitcoin, that you can redeem for that Bitcoin. That's not the case. It could trade at a premium or a discount to uh, its market value. And initially, because of the demand for Bitcoin, it was trading at a premium. Um, now, Grayscale was owned by, is owned by uh, Digital Currency Group, DCG, uh, which also owns <coughs> a, owned a, um, a financing vehicle called Genesis. Now, three, the third part of this equation was 3AC, which is... Uh, a Three Arrows Capital, which is, was a startup. It started really quickly and grew to be enormous. Um, and what it did is it, it borrowed money from Genesis using GBTC shares as collateral. Uh, how did it get then? Once it got this money from Genesis, it, it got Bitcoin from Genesis. It took the Bitcoin and it deposited it in Grayscale to create GBTC shares. So there's a mechanism where you could deposit GB, uh, BTC into Grayscale. You immediately get GBTC shares, but those shares were locked up for and couldn't trade for six months. So uh, they did this and they created new GBTC shares. Now, as they did this, Grayscale, which was owned by DCG, was growing its assets under management and it was making 2% per year on on, on these GBTC shares. So it had a real big incentive to do this. So there is a sense of DCG t instructing Genesis to make these loans so that they could grow grayscale. And then, you know, as the six month rollover ended, uh, IAC could unlock its GBTC shares, sell them in the secondary market, and realize dollars, uh, which they could use to then buy more Bitcoin, right? So there was, there was this sort of flywheel loop going on. 
Now that was the first financial piece of engineering. The second piece of financial engineering um, in that um, in that era was uh, MicroStrategy. So MicroStrategy, uh, run by Michael Saylor, decided to take a Bitcoin approach to his treasury. The first thing he did is he just went with his treasury and bought Bitcoin. He had $500 million, he bought $500 million of Bitcoin, no problem. The next thing he did is he said, okay, I'm gonna now borrow using uh, conventional loans. I'm gonna go borrow uh, <clears throat> using some of my Bitcoin as collateral. I wanna go borrow some more money. And I think it was $500 million of senior debt that he secured. And he took that $500 million and bought Bitcoin, okay? And then finally he came in now with, uh, with collateral, with uh, convertible uh, debt. And um, he issued convertible debt. And because the stock was so vo volatile, there was pretty good buyers for this, these converts. And um, they basically bought the convertible and then they shorted MSTR against it. So. Uh, you know, it, it was a, uh, some of them did anyways, but the, there was a pretty big uh, market for this convert and he was able to leverage and buy $2 billion worth of convertibles. So in total, he bought, borrowed two and a half billion dollars to buy Bitcoin. And you know, when Bitcoin was trading between 30 and $50,000 in 2021. Now, you know, the effect of both GBTC and MSTR doing financial engineering to create this product for mainstream investors, in my view, is, uh, you know, it's a lot of what kind of drove the uh, 2020 bull market. And I think if you look at uh, this bold report, you can kind of see that right here, right? So if you look here at the... Um, you know, in 2020, we we were doing about uh, we were doing about 300,000. There was about 300,000 Bitcoin worldwide in funds. Well, that number moved all the way up to uh, 700,000 by the end of 2020. And you know, by the peak of the the, the bull market was in February, March. Uh, we had you know 800,000 uh, Bitcoin held by funds. Now, note that. That number really did not decrease at all during the 2022 bear market, right? So these funds just sat on it, um, you know. Uh, and then we had this next spike, which was the uh, Bitcoin ETF. And, and, and just for reference, look in terms of the number of, uh, you know, we really had sort of 250,000 Bitcoin there in that phase, uh, whereas here, you know, the, the number of Bitcoin was double, right? Okay, but let's also recognize the Bitcoin is half as valuable here. So roughly speaking, so far this part has been equivalent to that in terms of dollars. Um, and let's just take another look at that. Um, we can look at it from uh, this perspective. Um, let me just get that chart. Um, uh, one second. I'm going to take a look at the actual flows themselves. Um, so if you look at the actual flows themselves, you'll see in 2020, we had, you know, this, this huge flow here right at the end. It reached a total of about 80,000, uh, uh, let's just say 80,000 Bitcoin a month, right? That was the peak. Uh, then it went basically to zero. Then we had you know, the, um, the ETF kind of uh, bonanza in February, March. I would say between February 15th and March 15th, basically one month of massive inflow. And it reached almost 160,000 Bitcoin per month. So, you know, extremely concentrated. And then it went to zero, right? So we, we're currently at kind of zero flows right now. Let's see if we get back into positive territory here. But, but for now, it was just a spike, right? I think we're going to go way into positive territory. So my point is this. My point is you know, 2017, it wasn't 
you couldn't, there was no real good way for funds to invest in Bitcoin. So, you know, it was limited to um, <clears throat> exchanges like Bitfinex, uh, Binance. It was limited to founders who were, you know, created stuff like uh, EOS or, uh, you know, EOS raised, by the way, in, in 20, they raised 4 billion and oh, eventually, a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of it went into uh, Bitcoin, right? Um, Block One owns 100,000 Bitcoin currently, right now, today, according to uh, to what we know uh, now. So um, that's just one. So that was 2017. 2020, we have already discussed, it was this kind of sailor and uh, grayscale uh, fund, uh, financial engineering create. And then in 2024, we now have this, uh, the CTF. So, you know, what does it really mean for the future? Well, I think we really cracked the mother load on financial engineering because now instead of billions of dollars, right, uh, we have effectively trillions of dollars, right? So, you know, it's, it's a hundred times more easily, easily a hundred times, the addressable market is easily a hundred times more uh, in size than the market for GBTC and, um, and MSTR. Because, you know, I think they, both of those found their niche and then they were significant, you know, but the ETF is much more of a mainstream product. So anyways, I hope that helps. Uh, that was my, uh, Kruger Bitcoin television for today. Um, and I'll catch you at the next episode. Thanks.